All right, well, we would like to welcome everyone here to new user training here at NURSE. My name is Charles Lively. I'm a science engagement engineer, and we will introduce our training team um, that we have here in person as well as online. Um, and so next to me, we have Helen. Yeah, Helen, <laughs> part of the user engagement group. I'm an HPC consultant and also a nurse training lady. And I'm Rebecca. I think some of you who are students met me last. So I, I uh, leader of the user engagement group here at NERS. And then we also have online uh, Dr. Lippi Gupta. Lippi? Hello, hi everyone. My name is Lippy, and uh, I'm also a science engagement engineer. I know I see my box is really small on the screen right now. Um, yeah, Charles and I work together on um, new user uh, training and uh, other kinds of activities to help users get going at NURSE. So um, feel free to chat with either of us if you have any questions or need more help. So you want to take things away with a few icebreakers? Yeah, sure. Just to get everybody warmed up and awake this morning. So if you're not part of this men mentee, please feel free to join us. You can use the QR code or you can go um, to mentee.com and use this um, code right here. Um, actually, I wonder. Let's see. Oh, there I can put it in the chat. There you go. Great, okay, let's go ahead and start. Um, I would love to hear from people, what are some words that describe your scientific research project? So it could be what you're doing this summer, it could be um, something you've done in the past. Just nice to hear what kinds of work people have going on. Ooh, wow. <clears throat> machine learning, quite a bit of machine learning, okay. Performance modeling, tensor networks. Wow, so a lot of people are already doing a lot of computational work. Um, great. Fantastic. That's awesome. Good. And now you have a feel for who's in the room. So there's all kinds of people. We have biology, we have people who are doing environmental science, math, applied math, all kinds of things. That's awesome. I um, would love to know where are you from? This could be where you consider home. It could be where you were born, where you were brought up. It could be where you are right now, where you go to school, whatever, wherever you would say you are from. For the record, I am broadcasting live from Corvallis, Oregon, if anyone knows where that is. Um, I am from Oregon and I live here in Corvallis, Oregon. Cool, oh, a couple of Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Sacramento. <clears throat> cool, Nigeria. Georgia, Holland, Pakistan. Wow, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, everyone. And this is sort of helpful for us to get a sense of how people are feeling going into today. Um, you know, are you totally brand new? Have you done some scientific uh, high performance computing? Um, you know, do you feel like HPC is really difficult or maybe you don't? Um, and then also getting a sense of, you know, do you think that these skills will help you in your future career path? Maybe they won't. Maybe HPC is not the most important part, but it could be useful to you. You can kind of rate what you think is important.
Great. <clears throat> Glad to see that the, the uh, let's see. So there's a couple of people who think that HPC is pretty difficult, but I'm glad to see some people are not feeling too intimidated. If you are, that's okay. Hopefully you'll feel less intimidated today. Um, okay, lots of people who are pretty brand new um, to scientific computing and a lot of people who think that uh, HPC skills will help them in their future path. So um, that's fantastic. And we hope that um, you will learn something today to get you started. And I think that might be my last, yes. Um, cool, so I'm actually gonna stop sharing and I will let Rebecca take it away from here. All right, well, thank you. Oh, uh, disabled participant page. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and start talking, I guess, so. <clears throat> I'm here primarily to welcome you all here to NERSC. I'm really happy that you're here and that you're going to um, work with us. Righty. Oh, here we go. Okay, so. Uh, all right, my name is Rebecca Hardman Baker. For those of you who don't know me, I lead the user engagement group here at NERSC. And uh, I'm here to welcome you and provide you with a bit of an overview about NERSC. Okay, so first we're going to have kind of an introduction to NERSC, so what we have hardware and our software. Um, we're going to provide you with sort of guidelines on interacting with NERSC staff and user responsibilities and expectations. So let's talk about NERSC first. So NERSC is an acronym. And it stands for the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. So we were established in 1974. That's 50 years ago. And if you stick around with us through October, uh, we're going to have our 50th anniversary celebration in October. Um, but our original mission was to enable computational science as a complement to magnetically controlled plasma experiments. So in fact, we didn't have the name NERSC at that time. It was, I don't remember the precise name, but it was more about plasma computing stuff, I don't remember. Today, our mission though, is to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science through high-performance computing and extreme data analysis. NERSC is a national user facility and it's housed here at Berkeley Lab, where I'm standing today and a lot of folks are here as well. So we are the Mission HPC Center for the DOE Office of Science Research. So the Department of Energy Office of Science is the largest funder of physical science research in the whole United States. Um, and they, they fund primarily these, these six areas. So bioenergy and environment, computing, materials, chemistry, and geophysics, particle physics and astrophysics, nuclear physics, and fusion energy and plasma physics. Our allocations of time and resources at NERSC are controlled primarily by the Department of Energy. So 80% of our awards go through the ERCAP program, which stands for Energy Research Computing Awards Process. Oh, I got it. Um, and so these proposals that people submit are selected by DOE program managers. They select who gets uh, resources and how much they get. 10% uh, of it goes to the DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge, that's ALCC. So Oscar is the, uh, uh, shoot, I can't remember Oscar, Advanced Scientific Strategic Computing Research, something like that? Somebody scientific. scientific Computing Research. Advanced Scientific Computing Research. Um, so that is one of these areas, you know, the computing area in Apps of Science. Uh, and so they have they have another allocations program that is for more high risk, but high pay, potentially high payoff for the projects, and that's the ALCC. So 10% of our time allocations goes to that. And then 10% of it is for nurse. Some of that we use for overhead for operations, testing things. Some of that we use for strategic uh, 
um, projects, like uh, for example, right now we're we're working a lot with people do uh, investigating quantum computing, which seems like has a very great future in the computing area. So we have about ten thousand users, and they're from about eight hundred different institutions, and we have users in all 50 states. We have users in Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico, just about everywhere. And we have users from 53 countries. There's, you know, roughly a thousand different codes that people are running, and we have hundreds of users logging in each day. And um, the, the reward of all of this is we have um, about 2,500 refereed publications per year that cite NERSC as a resource that they use. So our users are really amazing folks. They produce groundbreaking science. I'm not gonna really talk about this, but you can see there's just a wide variety of amazing and really interesting science that goes on on those resources. We're also really proud of our Nobel Prize winners. So we have been associated with six Nobel Prizes here. And um, you may notice there's one, the guy in the upper right here, this is Saul Perlmutter. Um, you may notice that we use his name. Our supercomputer is named Perlmutter, it's named after him. We name all of our machines after great scientists. And so um, we actually asked him, hey, would it be okay if we named our machine after you? And he said, yes. So here we are today. So let's talk about machines. Speaking of that, hardware. Okay, so at NERSC, you know, we, we get a new machine every five years or so. Um, so we, we, we have a whole bunch of machines that we've had in the past. Right now we're on the ninth one that we have, uh, that we have acquired in this, this way. Um, and it's called Perlmutter. Our next machine is gonna come in 2026. And yeah, we're actually already planning for it. So uh, we actually had some submissions of from vendors about what they would provide for us, and we have evaluated them. That's everything I can tell you about what will happen to that next system. So, um, I guess I already gave this away, but Saul Perlmutter, he won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for ex discovering the accelerating expansion of the universe. And the way he did that was he combined simulations and actual data analysis. Um, to, to make these conclusions. And uh, that was one of the first times that people had combined data analysis and experiments, well, simulations, I should say, um, into a single analysis. And so Perlmutter, the machine, we're using it for that a lot. Like we see a lot of people who are doing simulations and we see a lot of people who are doing data analysis. And so it's perfect combination on, uh, on our new system. And so one, one stipulation that he had was he felt like his last name was too long, many letters. So one stipulation that he had was that he had to also enable people to log in at sol.nursk.gov in addition to perlmutter.nursk.gov. So yes, that's much easier. Everyone can spell sol, not everyone can spell perlmutter. But what this means is that no one will ever name a computer after me. Okay, so on Perlmutter, we have two different types of ways. So we have two different types of nodes on the machine. Um, and so there's a type of node that has a, a CPU and four GPUs. And then we have a type of node that has two CPUs. And these all get stacked into the server racks. And I hope that everyone who's, who can come in person to Berkeley Lab will come and, and have a tour of our machine room because it's actually really interesting to see the machine in person. And here's a picture of what it looks like. That's not the machine, this part over here with the uh, hoses, interestingly, those are the cooling system. So the blue is the cool. Uh, liquid that goes in, and the the uh, red is the hot liquid, and you can actually feel those when you're down there in the machine room. You can feel that one is indeed hot and one is indeed cool. Okay, so we don't have only Perlmutter, but 
Pool litter is probably the big focus here. So in addition to having all of these nodes that we have, it has a, a 35 petabyte all flash scratch file system, which we're gonna talk about more in a few minutes, what that means. Um, and then all of the nodes are connected using the HPE Slingshot 11 interconnect. And it's um, very cool. It's a very high, fast, high speed interconnect. And we probably won't talk about it much more than that. So it has <clears throat> 3,072 CPU only nodes. So these are the ones we were talking about before where they just have two CPUs along with memory attached to those. And then we also have 1,792 GPU accelerated nodes. So each of these nodes has a CPU on it, and then it also has four GPUs. Um, so now we have established kind of what Perlmutter is like. Um, we're also attached to ESNet. So ESNet is a big network uh, that goes all the way across the country, all around the country. It actually goes over to Europe to CERN. Um, and it's basically, you can think of it as the Department of Energy's internet provider. So uh, we have the first terabit connections to ESnet. You add up two times 400 gigabit, two times 100 gigabit, that's a thousand terabit. There we go. Okay, so in addition, we have other systems in our center that uh, people will use a lot. So we've got a lot of storage. So we've got our tape archive uh, called HPSS archive. Uh, and yeah, it uses tapes, just like the old fashioned videotapes, only much more advanced, of course. Uh, and it holds about 300 petabytes. So just remember, we've got our flash scratch file system, this 35, it holds 300 petabytes. And I believe that's how much is in it currently, not how much capacity it has. Um, we have our global common file system, and it's about 130 petabytes. And uh, we uh, actually, I think that should be communicate files too. Anyway, uh, and then we've got our home directories, which everyone has a home directory. It's very small, and that's that's what we have there. Then um, we also have some what we call DTNs, that means data transfer nodes. You use them to transfer data from NERSC into NERSC. Uh, we have gateways, and then we have SPIN, which has some edge services, which is edge services, that's the way we think of it. Um, SPIN can kind of be an interface from the public, the web, to your data, for example, that is stored in one of these threads of file systems. Okay. All right, so um, let me cleverly put this in my presentation so that I could stop and ask if anybody has any questions. So maybe I've confused you all to death, but I have a quick question. don't have any questions. Or maybe everything I've said is so brilliant, it's so understandable that you don't have any questions. But yes. That's a random question, but what's the largest possible allocation of pearl mortar that somebody could have or what's has to use? Largest possible allocation on Perlmutter? Excellent question. Um, so um, I would say typically the largest ones that we see are maybe 100,000 node hours. Um, the thing is like, there's a, you know, you have to calculate it out, do the math, right? So there's 365 days times 24 hours times the number of nodes, right? And that would give you how many node hours would be available if we we had the system running at all times and perfect in every way, right? We usually kind of like maybe take 90% of that because we want to be a little conservative. And then we take that and we divide whatever that number is to 80% that goes to our, our DOE programs. And then the 10% and 10% for the ALCC and then for us. Um, so, then the, those programs, they each get a fraction of that. So, I mean, the largest, I think they get maybe four million each by the time it really comes down to it, um, depending on the program. 
Um, so somewhere we have a web page that details all of this, actually. Uh, but typically, the, I think the biggest ones that we've seen are maybe 100 or 200,000. So not terribly huge, but it kind of depends on how the allocation manager decides to divide up the, the uh, allocation, the total amount that they have. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Maybe you could explain like when they award like the Gordon Bell Prize in computing, uh -huh. what type of computing um, powers are they use for oh, big simulations? Like great that? question. Okay. So if you're doing something like the Gordon Bell Prize, if you're trying to win that prize, you have to do these large system runs. And um, so that would use like all of Perlmutter or at least all of the GPU nodes on Perlmutter. So if we go back here. And uh, I guess maybe, does everyone, has everyone heard of the Gordon Bell Prize in supercomputing? So it's a big prize awarded by ACM every year at the supercomputing conference, which will be in Atlanta in November. Um, so if you have never been, you should try and come. And they basically award prizes for prize for uh, researchers that have um, achieved some significant scientific results using platforms. Right. So, uh, so yes. Hopefully, everybody can hear that. I'll try to repeat. So, the Gordon Bell Prize is for running these big simulations that do some that have some kind of a scientific impact, not just for running big things sake um, on, on, a, on a supercomputer. And so yes, we have had a few people who have done that uh, with Perlmutter. And so they've used all of our GPU nodes. So you see, we've got 17, 1,792 GPU nodes. So typically what they will do is they will request a reservation on all of the nodes, as many as we can possibly provide them with. And that being said, we don't always have all 1,792 available, but let's say 1,700 of them, just because we're optimists today. Uh, and so they take that 1,700 nodes for like 10 hours. So you can do that math. So that would be 17,000 uh, node hours that they would be spending on trying to run one of these things. Typically these runs, it's not, it's not that the run takes 10 hours, it's that they run it multiple times. So the run itself could just be for one hour. So. That's, the, that's kind of what we see with those types of reservations. Um, any other questions? It was, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any specific wall time for any users? Like you mentioned 10 hours for the GP nodes. Do you have more for like less nodes or it's like ISD that will take an hour? Great question. So question was about sort of about our queue policy. Like how long can jobs run on ours? So right now, um, we can run jobs for up to 24 hours. And that's any, any type of job. Um, typically, you know, they have these reservations for 10 hours because they need to be there paying attention to what's going on, right? Um, and you could, I mean, you could, I guess you could stay up for 24 hours, but probably wouldn't want to. So that's why it's typically just kind of a day or a long day that they do when they're doing those types of things. But um, most user jobs, as you learn, um, just kind of get submitted to the system and then they just run while you're off doing something else. Um, and so those jobs, they can run for up to 24 hours right now. We are looking at um, having a longer wall time on the machine, but basically we try to keep it below 48 hours. Like 48 hours is as much as we'll ever go up to um, simply because of how we operate the system. But, um, you know, we when Perlmutter first came online, our all time was like eight hours, then it was 12 hours, then it was, you know, 24, and then we're going to go up to 48 at some point, hopefully soon. Okay, great question. And let's go on. So, um, yeah, so next we're going to really talk about storage. So we talked about compute nodes. Now we're going to talk about storage. So this is kind of a simplified model of storage and memory, right? So the, the, the best performing memory is, or the best performing yeah, memory sort of processes is, uh, is the memory that's on a node, right? Very fast, lightning fast, good bandwidth, 
very limited in capacity, right? Also volatile, it'll go away. Um, so then the next thing that we have is our scratch file system, right? Performance of it is really good because it's all flash file system. Um, there's a lot more of it, right? <laughs> you know, you've got maybe 512 gig of memory per node, but on Scratch, we've got 35 petabytes, so that's a pretty big difference. Um, and it, it's got really good performance. Um, so then next we've got the community file system, okay? So um, community file system is a global file system, unlike Scratch, which is just local to Perlmutter. The community file system is accessible from, if we had two supercomputers, we would have both of them connected to the community file system, but if we had two machines, only one of them would be connected to each of their own scratch systems. Okay, uh, and then we've got our HBSS tape archive, uh, and that's archival storage. It's kind of like the deep freeze is what I think of it as. So it's a place where you put stuff where you're not going to, uh, you're not going to want to access it frequently, but it's something that needs to, to be preserved. Okay, and then um, we've got, in addition, we've got our global common uh, space, which is where we put shared software for your projects. And then we've got a global home, which is your individual home directory. So next we're going to talk about my really bad analogy. Well, it's not that bad, but it's imperfect. Let's put it that way. No analogy is perfect. This is definitely no exception to that. So if you can imagine that computing is like baking, and the input is baking ingredients, right? And the output is cake. Talk about cake because cake is delicious. So NERSC, you can think of it as a dynamic shared kitchen space with all the latest kitchen gadgets. So you can think of Perlmutter as the oven where you put your cake in it to bake it, right? You can think of home and the community file system as kind of your pantry or your fridge area where you have it's where you store a lot of your ingredients uh, when you're not baking. HPSS is the freezer. That's why I said deep freeze last slide here. Um, and then Scratch is like your kitchen counter. Okay. Everybody's sort of following my somewhat limited analogy so far. Okay. So when you're baking, especially like if you're on a cooking show, right? You stage all of your ingredients. Like you have like the little bowl of and you have like a little tiny bowl of baking powder and stuff like that, right? So you stage them from your pantry and your fridge and you put them on the counter, right? And then, um, so that's, that's sort of the analogy here. Like when you're gonna compute something, you wanna stage your data and your executable onto scratch from these other places, like from your home directory, from the, community file system, et cetera. Okay, and so then you do whatever it is to combine your ingredients and you put it in the oven. And then after you're baking, you wanna clean up after yourself, okay? So like, that's what the Scratch file system is. It's kind of like this shared space that we're all using. So that when the next person comes along, there's going to be space for them to stage all of their little ingredients and stuff. So typically, you know, after you bake your cake, you take it out and you put it on the counter, right? And you let it cool off. That's normal. That's totally fine. You can leave your outputs in Scratch for a while, but not for too long because if, uh, if you leave them there for too long, then we're going to clean up after you. And it's not going to be in the way that you would want. So we have what's called scratch purge. So what that means is that we're going to basically take everything on the counter that's old, that hasn't been accessed in a while, just going to just wipe it off, and we're just going to put it in the trash. Okay? So it's not going to be in the way that you like. And that would include your cake. I think it too. It sits there for too long. Okay. Um, so then let's talk a little bit about software. So uh, on Perlmutter, we have, um, you know, we have an operating system, just like every computer. Uh, it 
it's a little bit different, however. Uh, and so on Perlmutter, we have a version of Linux. Okay, and it's going to be just like for, for a user, it's going to be exactly the same as any kind of Linux if you've ever used Linux. Um, but it's kind of optimized for the for these types of machines by our vendor, who is uh, HPE or Cray. Um, and because of this, you know, some of your applications may not run straight out of the box. There's going to be some work that you may need to do to get things to run. Um, and so we really encourage you to use nurse provided compilers and libraries um, uh, when you're if you want to compile your own code. Um, otherwise, we have a number of applications that are available via modules. And so you'll learn about how to do that. Don't worry, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into it, but you'll learn about that later on. Um, and then there's another option where a, a lot of software is also available through what's called what we call E4S. We have the SPAC package manager, and probably most people here have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about here, which is fine. We'll learn about it later. But just know that there are a lot of different ways that you can uh, access um, a software that will help you to run. Either you can just run it you know, we already have that one compiled for you, or we have libraries and compilers, and we have uh, stack packages that you can use to help you be able to compile your code. Okay, so we do have a lot of, oh, we've got a poll. <laughs> okay, this is a Zoom poll. So are you comfortable working with and using Linux operating system? Okay, trying to see. How people feel about Linux. Okay, so we've got so far pretty good. We've got about seventy-five to eighty percent people are feeling comfortable with Linux. Um, we've got twenty percent, twenty-five percent who are not yet comfortable. Um, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> are we going to share it? Are you sharing? Sure. You shared. It. Okay. So that's our final answer. We got 78% of you feel comfortable with uh, Linux, and we've got 22% who do not feel comfortable with Linux. Um, so there are some really great tutorials out there. I recommend looking up software carpentry. Software carpentry has some really, really helpful tutorials that'll, that'll get you started running on Linux. Okay, so write that down. Software carpentry. We'll send out tools and stuff at the end of the training in our follow-up course on for all of these additional goodies that you can have access to. You can close that. Great. Okay, so we have a lot of different oh there too. Okay, sorry. I closed it on my own screen. Um yes. So we have a lot of different chemistry and material science applications that are available that uh, people can access. Um, and then we also have a very rich data ecosystem. So there's a lot of different applications and um, you know, data management, data analytics, visualization, uh, workflow uh, managers, also a lot of ML stuff that, um, that we offer here. Uh, and so you all should be able to use a lot of those if you're doing the data analysis or machine learning sort of thing. Okay. Now, on Perlmutter, the way that we sort of function um, in terms of being able to access software is we use what's called a module system. So you load certain modules, and depending on what type of, 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 of um, programming environment that you want. And so you know, this will be covered more in depth than here. So don't worry if you don't quite understand what I'm talking about. So uh, we offer these different um, programming environments. So one is NVIDIA, um, and then we've got PCE, which is the, the uh, gray one. We've got GNU, that's our default, uh, LLVM, and Intel. And so it's kind of depending on what you're doing. So if you're using Fortran, C, or C++, then you can pretty much use any of these environments. Um, if you want to use CUDA, then you can't use you know, a few of them. You can kind of get the picture here. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. 
as to uh, which one you should use. Okay. And again, we're going to cover a lot more of this in depth later. So don't worry if you don't completely understand what I'm sure. Okay, so then let's talk about interacting with nurse staff. Okay, so first we're going to talk about micro, and then we're going to talk about consulting and account support and operations. So my group here, that's me right there. And then we've got our other folks who are, who are in our group right now. Um, and see, we are a fun group of people, smiling, and we all love helping users. That's like literally our job, get paid to do that. So uh, then we'll talk about the NUG, that's the nurse user group. Uh, so this is our nurse user community. Um, and it's a great source of advice and feedback for us. Um, we have regular teleconferences, community calls that, um, that we host. Uh, and we encourage you to join our Slack, okay? Uh, there's that link. I hope somebody can actually put that into the chat here so people can look in there. You gotta log in to, to access our uh, Slack um, and then sign up for our Slack through a link that I that I have posted there. And then well, we also really want you to join us October 22nd and 24th for our 15th anniversary. It's gonna be held down in Berkeley at the uh, Residence Inn. It's gonna be a really good time. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I encourage everyone to attend. Okay, so then <clears throat> another thing that we do is we do training. So Helen, sitting over here who came up here earlier. She is my training lead. So she sort of oversees the whole training program. And so we provide, thanks to Helen and all of the efforts of her and everyone else who works on training, uh, we provide a very robust training program for everyone. So we try to get, you know, like today, this is really aimed at beginners, but we also have more advanced sort of um, trainings. And then we have trainings that are in specialized interests and so kind of different personas is what we call it, like the type of user who might be interested in doing certain activities. Uh, all of our trainings, oh, we record them and then we professionally caption them and we post them onto our YouTube channel. And we post the slides on the training event board. All right, training event webpage afterwards too. Uh, so we've got a, a web, part of our website dedicated to training. Um, and so that's, I would encourage you to visit that. And of course we have a collection of categorized materials and we have an archive of all the previous trainings that we've done, at least in the fairly recent past. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about uh, consulting and account support. So talk about user tickets and user appointments. So this is the whole team of folks who, uh, work on your tickets. So when you send in a, a question to nurse, one of these intelligent people will be answering your question. Um, and so the way that you, the, bit, the, the most straightforward way to get help from nurse is to send us a ticket. And so what you do is you go to help.nurse.gov and it's going to look a lot like this. And then uh, you click on this one right in the middle there, open ticket. And so you open a ticket with any kind of question that you might have. And the thing is, I know this is amazing, you may not believe it, but most of the people, well, as far as I know, all of the people who work for me are not migrators. So what we really need from you is your help so that we can help you. So provide us with as many specifics as you can about what's going on. And if you just tell us uh, my, my my job died, oh, okay. But what job, what were you trying to do? What was the job ID number? You know, give us that kind of information because otherwise we're gonna have to get back to you and say, hey, can you tell us what was your job number? What were you doing? What were you trying? Blah, blah, blah. Right. And that's just going to take even more time and it's going to make it harder for you to get help on your issue in a timely manner. Okay. 
Uh, and in fact, we have a page in our documentation about how to file a good ticket. So if, you're, if you aren't quite sure if what you're asking is uh, is specific enough, you know, you can just take a look at that and get an idea about uh, you know, how to how to make sure that your ticket is the best that it can be. Okay, so now here's what we do. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, we guarantee to you that our first response will be within four business hours. So our business hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., except for holidays. So if you send in a ticket at 2 a.m., we're not going to get to it until 8, okay? Even then, you may have a lot. So we're going to get to it sometime before noon, for sure. Um, and then if you send in a ticket over the weekend, similarly, we're not going to get to it until Monday morning because we keep these business hours. So when we're working with you on, on an issue, we're going to help you resolve your problem and keep you up to date on the progress that we are making. And we're going to try to accommodate user needs that don't fit within our regular operating structure. That's something that we try to do. And we also welcome your feedback and constructive criticism. So if you send in a ticket and um, and you um, uh, you know and it and it completes, then also you will get sent a user survey so to see how how did we do. And I'll have you know I read all of those. So please feel free to make any kind of feedback or constructive criticism uh, for how did we do and how can we serve better. Okay, so another thing that we do is user appointments. So in 2018, we began offering office hours and uh, we still do offer office hours. So there's gonna be an office hours on Friday after this is over, uh, specifically aimed at, at uh, attendees here um, in this user training. Um, so anyway, and office hours is like an open Zoom meeting where you can join in to get help on something specific. Um, but the problem that we saw with office hours is that, uh, I guess it's a lot like university office hours, I was thinking. So you have a long period where nobody comes, and then suddenly 12 people come on at once. You know? and, and so that was kind of a, a, an annoying aspect of, of office hours. So we decided, hey, what about appointments? We have more efficient use of everyone's time. So we offer 30 minute appointments on a variety of topics. Um, and you can schedule one at nursc.as.me. Okay, you can go to that site, you can get an appointment with uh, one of these folks or one of my, myself even on certain topics, okay? Now, finally, let's talk about our operations folks. So we have operational staff on site here at the, at the lab, down in the, the basement. Um, uh, they are on site 24 7, 365 days uh, to supervise the operation of the machine room. They're there to kind of make sure that nothing catches on fire and that everything's going well. They know a lot about the health of the machines. And um, also, they can help you with some tasks like filling jobs or um, changing a running reservation or ending, it, ending a reservation. Um, but we encourage you to avoid contacting them except in case of urgency. Um, they also maintain our MOTD, which stands for message of the day. And it's really, it, you can think of it as a live status, like how are systems doing? Like are they up, are they down, like what's happening? Um, so anyway, our operations staff are amazing and they work really hard and so it's best if we can avoid contacting them unless there's something very urgent that you can't get around. I see a hand. Yes. Are there times when we can't kill our own jobs? Um, usually you can kill your own job, but sometimes it won't do it for whatever reason. So they can help you with that. They have they have sort of kind of limited group abilities on the machine. Okay. Any other questions? Last section will just. Oh, okay. You wonder if it's that. If you can, if not, I can keep it. You don't look good. <laughs> okay. Any last questions for me?
keep now or forever hold your peace. peace. I got another meeting. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh,